We are in Genesis chapter 40 this morning. And if you were here with us, or if you were online last week, uh, or uh, following along, you know, um, we've been looking at Joseph in particular over the last couple of weeks, uh, looked at his being sold into slavery, uh, then this season of prosperity, if you will, uh, under Potiphar, right? He's, in, he's Potiphar's personal steward. Uh, and then being put into prison under false accusation from Potiphar's wife, and then finally within the prison, finding favor with the prison keeper. Now, despite his very real difficulty in his circumstances, uh, Joseph uh, continues to mature in his faith. I mean, the, the things are, are really, truly hard for him. This is not just something that we are imagining or uh, that we want to dismiss because things are getting better for him, Uh, he's still in prison. Life, he's still been stripped of uh, his personhood, uh, from his his family and all those kinds of things. Uh, Everything has changed for him. And yet, here in the middle of it, what we recognize is that Joseph has owned his failures. He stopped blaming And he stopped exploiting, right? Because early on, when everything was going his way, he was exploiting his circumstances. Now, instead of exploiting his circumstances, he is trying to do the best he can in the circumstances that are given to him. Now, having done all that did not save him from false accusation and difficulty. And I think that's important because oftentimes in our idea, our concept of Christianity that has become very westernized and oftentimes really paganized in terms of how we treat God, we come to God oftentimes more with a pagan mindset than we do a Christian or a biblical mindset. And that now we expect, I have given my offering to the gods and now they're supposed to bless me. That is paganism and it's purest form, if your thought is that because you did something for God that now God owes you, that's called paganism. That is not Christianity. It is not biblical. And you are as far away from Christianity as you could possibly be from the witness of Scripture. The witness of Scripture is that in the midst of things, God is always good and that He uses difficulties, circumstances, trials, and hardships to shape us because He is more interested in our character than our comfort and that our final reward, if you will, the great blessing is, is that as our character is transformed and we become more and more like Him, He is fitting us for the final revelation of His kingdom, the kingdom come in its fullness and that, that's where the great blessing comes of sense of peace and, and prosperity and all those kind of things, because that is ultimately his desire, is that when we are all living like that in the kingdom, then there'll be no more sorrow. Then there'll be no more pain, no more suffering. And why? Because God's will is being done perfectly in the kingdom. Until then... Look to the right and look to the left and realize it's your fault as much as the person next to you that the world is fallen, right? It's not their fault any more than it is your fault. And that the truth is it's everybody's fault. So in that, we, we have this story of Joseph unfolding uh, and in the midst of all of his circumstances and his difficulty, accusations, and he's not rescued from circumstances. Instead, he's in the middle of his circumstances, and we're reminded of just you know passages that tell us that Jesus, whenever he came, came right into our circumstances not to deliver us from them, but he walked with us and was tempted and tried in all the same ways that we are, and yet, and this is the important part, was without sin. And so the invitation then is to walk and to be like him so that we are growing in our character and personhood so that we do not continue to behave in a way that is contrary to him. Now, in the midst of all of that, 
Uh, part of uh, our sinful nature then is to wallow in self-pity and to blame everybody else rather than owning our own stuff. Joseph is growing and beginning to realize that he can't do that anymore. He's got to live in a way that honors God, not in spite of his circumstances, but right in the middle of them. So looking back to when we first met Joseph a couple of weeks ago in Genesis 37, we we see him having some pretty amazing dreams from God that go to his head. Anybody here ever like been told you were smart, handsome, good looking or something like that? And, uh, you know, it went to your head uh, in that moment. Joseph's having dreams about how he's going to be uh, honored and exalted, and it, it goes to his head. Instead of recognizing the opportunity, he's thinking in terms of the privilege. So many of us uh, in this room, you know, uh, as we have read the Bible over the years, are familiar with this story And what we do then in our heads is we run ahead to the conclusion. We go, yeah, but he gets out and everything's fine and yada, yada, yada. And and what I want to ask you to do today is not run ahead in your thoughts. I want you to let the storyline unfold to you. And I want you to consider the bigger context of what God was doing for everyone not just Joseph, because the tendency for us as Americans, me included, is we always think about what God's doing for me and what I'm going to get out of it. And I want you to see what God was doing for everyone and how Joseph was used by God, not just for his sake, but for the sake of all. So at this point in the storyline, Joseph's dreams look like a bunch of foolishness rather than prophecy, right? He's not being bowed down to. In fact, he's the one that's doing all the bowing. He was in prison with no hope of reprieve. His father, Jacob, believes Joseph to be dead, so no one's on the lookout, right? No one's looking for him. No one is searching for him. And yet, in the midst of all of these trials, he remembers the goodness of God and realizes that God's goodness is not determined by circumstances. That instead, the goodness of God is known to us by His faithfulness to do what He said He would do in the way He said He would do it, regardless of anyone else's cooperation or participation in the project that is called humanity. With that said, let's take a look in Genesis chapter 40. Beginning in verse 1, if you're using a phone or a tablet, please set that to silent. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Please follow along in whatever translation is in your lap. That one's my favorite. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house, the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them, and they continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker uh, of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in the master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we've had dreams and there was no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to him, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph And said to him, in my dream there was a vine before me. And on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, 
This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into this pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream with three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. And in three days, Pharaoh will lift your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. And on the third day, which was Joseph, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants and lifted up the head of his chief cupbearer and the head of his chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. All right, so one of the things that you need to know about uh, Egyptian uh, paganism, culture, religion, however you want to refer that way, is that uh, the, the idea that the, of sleep as being a spiritual connection, which I don't think is terribly far off from reality, uh, to be honest, but uh, certainly understood uh, in the minds of the Egyptian people and their uh, religion was this idea that when one was asleep, that you were in the presence of the gods, that you were in the mystical place uh, of connecting with the spirit realm, and so therefore all dreams were seen as the gods speaking to you. Instead of thinking that maybe I had a little too much, uh, you know, uh, beer last night, or maybe I had uh, too many, uh, uh, you know, uh, Egyptian hot dogs or whatever, I don't know. Uh, I, in, instead of thinking that, the assumption was always that dreams were your connection to the spirit world and that everything was meaningful. And therefore, the profession of being a dream interpreter was highly regarded in their, in their culture and in their understanding. Of, uh, there was a station of being a dream interpreter that one arose to through great training uh, and understanding. And so it was significant to be uh, a dream interpreter. In fact, uh, to be a dream interpreter in the court of Pharaoh would have been uh, uh, exceptional. It would have been uh, put you in the highest of standings. Uh, If you've ever um, maybe even seen the cartoon, The Prince of Egypt, you know, and how the uh, the, uh, uh, priests and things like that were held, this would have put you into that class, that priestly class, and and given you an identity in uh, Pharaoh's court that would be highly regarded. And so uh, uh, the idea of dream interpretation really meant something, and uh, obviously they are now out of the court and in the prison uh, with Joseph in this situation. Now, if you'll remember last week, if you were with us, if you don't, let me just uh, fill you in. When Joseph lost his place in Potiphar's house, he didn't go to just any prison. He didn't go to the commoner's prison, which would be common for a slave. Uh, The fact that he was accused of trying to uh, rape the master's wife would have normally ended in a death sentence. He has now been put into into Pharaoh's prison because Potiphar is the captain of the guard. And so this is Potiphar's prison. And the people who are in that prison are political prisoners typically like the servants of the king and things like that. So he, if you will, he's kind of in the white collar prison, but even still they don't have access to the interpreters and things like that. And so Joseph, being a man of compassion, 
sees their situation, sees the downcast in their face, and begins to ask questions. He's concerned for their well-being. Now, if you have ever, uh, you know, and I don't need to know, you know, but if you have ever uh, been in jail or maybe even visited someone in jail or maybe you've had a family member or a friend that's gone to jail, they're not typically like places of great hospitality, you know? I, typically, you don't see like a Yelp rating like, wow, the best prison and the best food, I've, I'm going back as soon as I can, right? Now, I, I've, I have had the occasion to hear that apparently that there are some Yelp ratings uh, for some prisons uh, because of the quality of their food. Uh, however, none of them are getting a four-star rating. I'm just saying uh, I think they're on that scale for another reason at the other end of the scale altogether. But nonetheless, uh, uh, it's not known as a place of compassion. In fact, to find compassion, typically uh, in a prison, you know, I, I worked in prison ministry for a while whenever I was in Bible college and uh, worked in a youth prison facility. And uh, one of the things that you knew right away is if somebody was... Try, being overly nice to somebody, that something bad was about to happen. You were about to become their possession, and you didn't even know it. And so typically when someone's being nice in prison, it puts people on guard. But this is the white-collar prison, and, and there's a different thing going on here altogether, and Joseph, being a man of compassion, responds to them and, uh, and offers to interpret their dreams. Listen to those words again, not from schooling, but from the Spirit of God at work within him. Do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. Now, understand that in this situation, Joseph is taking a really big risk, probably not for the reasons you're thinking, but the reality is, is because of the station of dream interpretation in uh, Egyptian culture and society, he's presuming on station. Now, in the United States, we as Americans, we presume on station all the time. We think nothing of that. We don't think of hierarchy in terms of our society. Uh, in fact, uh, if someone is in a high station, sometimes we're even intentionally rude to people like that to prove that they're not over us, which is usually to our own detriment, but nonetheless. It is, in our society, normative to be sometimes even rude or condescending to people who are in station over us to prove that we are independent. But when you are in a monarchy, don't you dare presume. See, if you, you go back to, to even reading in terms of like uh, society in Great Britain and things like that a uh, hundred years ago, you quickly recognize that nothing like what you and I uh, experience in terms of freedom and the ability to position ourselves uh, is uh, so really rare in the scheme of things around the world. And so in this point, there is a real danger in what he's presuming upon and in, in the, in the thing that he's about to ask. And yet, as I said, there's not a lot of... Uh, not a lot of empathy or sympathy in a prison. There's not a lot of compassion. And so despite the fact that the occult practices of uh, uh, Egypt were highly respected and regimented, as he speaks up, they hear the earnestness from him and the simple fact that he gives the honor to God. And he uses the very generic Phrase for God. He's not, he's not referring to Yahweh, the personal covenant God of the people of Israel. He, he uses the more generic Elohim. It's still, still specifically his God, but he's using, you see, El would be the singular form, Elohim, 
they may have, how they may have heard it is just like this. Does not interpretation belong to the gods? That would have been a very generic sense in which they would have probably heard that. And so out of that, there's a sense of respect that comes and they allow him to hear their dreams because they're at a loss. Have you ever been desperate? Where, you know, the kind of desperate that you're willing to listen to anybody, right? And when you're in prison, when you've been stripped of Pharaoh's court, and you're not even sure entirely why, you're desperate. And so the, in the, you can almost smell this desperation in this setting. What do these dreams mean? What's happening to us? Now, over and over again, over the last couple of chapters, we've seen clearly that Yahweh, the God of covenant Israel, is with Joseph. And Joseph, by implication, is developing an intimate relationship with God so that his confidence in God is no longer born out of arrogance. Remember, in the past, it was arrogance. I am the son of Jacob. Uh, I am the, he's the promised, uh, you know, and so, uh, and I'm being exalted so clearly I'm the person of promise next. And, and he thought a lot of himself up to this point. So he, what he's thinking is, is, well, God shares a high opinion of me that I have also. Anybody here ever thought that God shares a high opinion of you as you do? Um, yeah, sadly, I can say that there were definitely moments in my life where I thought God shared the same opinion I did of me. And, but this is different. We have watched as he has humbled himself and God has been working in his circumstances. And so now the confidence that he has in God is no longer out of that arrogance, but is out of a real sense of piety. And he's not testing God. He's not throwing out something and saying, well, God has to show up in this moment. It, it's because he knows God. See, there is a huge, although subtle, difference in those two things. See, one makes declarations because we take scriptures out of context or something like that, and the other one actually has a sense of intimacy in which it is leaning into this and says, I know God will do these things not because I can name and claim a verse, but because I know Him. Isn't it true as you have intimacy with people in terms of relationship, real intimacy, and you become to know their character, that you oftentimes find yourself speaking for that person in ways that are really bold, but because you know who they are, you, you know their character, you, you have confidence. In fact, if they answered contrary to that, you would be stunned. What? I, I, I can't believe that. I, I know in growing up in my home, like there was certain things I knew that were inbounds and out of bounds in my home without them ever having been, like there wasn't a chart of rules, there wasn't a list of the Ten Commandments in my home of things you can and cannot do. Uh, I, I knew that if my mom had cleaned the house for a party, I better not make a mess. However, the rest of the time, I knew I was free to make a mess. Because my mom was like dutiful cleaning all the time and everything, and, and she just like ignored most of my messes and would just clean them up, you know? I mean, like, but I never, I didn't get in trouble for making a mess unless we were having a party, and then I better not, under pain of death, make a mess, which I found out a couple of times. So, um, and, but I did survive, obviously. <laughs> Nonetheless, there were unspoken rules because there was relationship, and I knew how it worked, right? right. Uh, my, my wife and I often speak for one another about things because we just simply say, well, I, I know their character, uh, I can tell you this, if someone tells me that my wife said something and it absolutely contradicts what I know my wife actually said, 
and then they want to imply that my wife is lying, I know who the liar is right away. Because of all the things I know about my wife, under pain of death, she will not lie. So I don't have to, if someone tells me my wife is lying, I know who the liar is and it's not my wife. I know her character. If she were to lie, like that would be like one of the biggest shockers in my entire life because, you know, we've been together a long time now and I, I've never seen her do it, not even under the most painful of circumstances that cost her. So Joseph Joseph says what he does about God interpreting, not because he's arrogant, not because he's assuming, not because he's taking a scripture out of context, but because he actually knows God. That's what makes it huge. So he's not testing God. He is confident in God. I used to think to myself, how does a person know when to speak? How did Peter know when to tell the guy to, to rise and walk? But over time, I've discovered that the real issue is not being told when, but out of an intimacy with God that comes from spending time with Him. When you learn God in His ways, when you hear His voice, then it changes everything. And I'm quite certain as we watch this story unfold, that Joseph had a lot of time on his hands to spend with God. <laughs> Something about being in prison and not having a whole lot to do. And they didn't have TV back then in the prisons, right? So Joseph spent a lot of time with God in the school of prayer, getting to know him. The second thing is that in spite of all the circumstances, Joseph still believes not only that God gave him those dreams, but that he would yet see them fulfilled regardless of his circumstances, right? He still believes in the interpretation of the dreams. He still believes that God is the one giving those dreams. He's looking back at his circumstances, and yet he still has this confidence that God is with him and for him in those things. There's, there, there is something about that that ought to capture our hearts right, is that because if we think about it in really practical terms, really, if we put it in our own life situation, how confident would we be in dreams as a whole if we had seen our dreams crash seemingly to the ground? Would we still be holding those dreams? Would we still be confident in God? Joseph is. And he believes in, in, in his dreams. He, he doesn't think it was just too much mutton before bedtime. Uh, he, he really believes that God is working in all of this and that God can give an answer. And so as Joseph's confidence grows and as he, begin, as he continues to trust in God, he speaks into the heart of the situation, out of his compassion. And if you ever wonder where Joseph's head is at, listen to this one statement. He talks about being stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. I was kidnapped. And it was not just. But I believe yet that I will escape this place that God has something better for me. Amen. Most of us at that point would have given up. But this is telling us about who he's discovering that God is in the midst of it. He makes a connection between his dreams and confident that God is speaking in these dreams that these men have had. And yet, the chapter ends in a very sad way for you and I, specifically for Joseph. And yet, it says, the, the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. 
not exactly the way that we would have written it. I mean, in, in fact, today, if you were talking about the average Christian movie today, right? You know, it's two hours long, and people go from being in this terrible situation to everything is solved, you know, two hours later, and everybody, like, that was the bad guy either dies, you know, because they, you know, contradicted the Christian, or they become, uh, they get saved too. Everybody gets saved. And, and, but you know, and I know, that in reality, that's not how it works, so that's what drives me nuts about the Christian movie industry is just like they try to sew up everything and nothing's left in tension, nobody, disobey, nobody does anything wrong, and, and that gives you a false sense of what it means to be a Christian. Because the thing is in the Scriptures is that there's always a tension. There's always pieces that are left hanging. There is always people who are being willful. There are always people who are disobedient. That is real life. That's real Christianity. And so here, the story ends in that terrible tension, right? You know, like, I mean, one guy dies, and, and Joseph is left with no sense of hope in that moment except the hope that he has in God, not in his circumstances. Has God ever used you for a noble purpose? Maybe to bless someone else, only for them to forget you? Or worse yet, even act against you or against the will of God in a way that was damaging to you? You know, typically in those moments, because we know God is the author of all good things, we also tend to blame Him, right? God, I... I thought you were going to, God, I thought you should have. I wonder what went through the mind of Joseph in that moment. How many days did he wait for the deliverance that never came? Did he go through a time where he was angry at the cupbearer? Were there moments maybe when he was disappointed in God? We don't know. Doesn't tell us. But here's what I do know. I know from my own heart that even though my trajectory might be like this, to those who are on the outside looking in, that it's really more like So you get to see this, point A to point Z, and miss B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and you go, oh, man, Pastor Hal's got it all wrapped up. Man, I wish I was, my walk was like that. Your walk is like that. It is. Just you see everything in between. And so we're going to turn the page and Joseph's life is going to get amazingly better. Big things are going to happen. We're going to, and, and, and then this is how we will tell this story to children. Well, you know, Joseph trusted God. He had these dreams and then he went through a hard time and then he trusted God and everything was better. And we act as if it was like Literally, how long it took us to turn from pages 37 to chapter 41, right? But you turn your, depending on the size of your Bible, that's what, two pages? And so we think that's how it's supposed to happen. You turn two pages, it's all good. Forgetting that there's 20 some odd years of events. That's 10, that's 10 years a page, right? really important for you and I to keep those things in mind. And so whenever we have those moments where when things are not going the way they're supposed to, or even we feel forgotten or abandoned or whatever else, that's actually the moment to press into God, not to run away from Him. So here He is in the jail still doing good things, still trying to do the right thing. 
And the story, for our purposes today, ends right there. Not knowing how soon his deliverance is to come. And our tendency is just to forget everything that had to happen in the meantime. Do you know, if you've been reading for the Bible, the Bible for any amount of time in your life, I think it's really important that you take time to linger over those stories and read between the lines. People often ask me, they said, Pastor, where do, you, where do you get all those things? Can I just tell you that the majority of it comes from spending time in the lingering? There are times in my walk where I will read in, intensively all the way through. I, I have regularly, at least one time a year, read my Bible from cover to cover in a, a span of 60 days. Um, if you want to know, if you put your Bible uh, on um, audio, if you go to like a Bible gateway and you listen, it takes 72 hours to listen to your entire Bible. That's all. If you just listen and you read along, it will take you 72 hours. You can go through the entire Bible in 72 hours. That's like what, a marathon of Marvel movies? I bet you like half the people in this room have done them, downloaded an entire series and watched it and spent 72 hours watching what? Right? There's like, what, 13 years of friends or something? Or, you know, I mean... In 72 hours, you can go through your entire Bible. There's value in that because it helps you hold stories together and think through the bigger picture of how the Bible is a single story from Genesis to Maps. But there is real value in the lingering where you actually stop and meditate and consider the things that aren't said as you piece things together and realize the timelines that are involved, how, the struggle. How many years did it happen? Oh, there's a segue there. And I pick up, there's a hundred years that have passed. Man, that is, those things are, are really important in the shaping of who we are in Christ. That is a significant part of spiritual formation. Linger over the fact that it was hard. Linger over the fact that it was long. Linger over the fact that was God was with him, but it did not exempt him from life's troubles. Linger over the fact that sometimes, that sometimes the heroes felt just like you. Lost, forgotten, abandoned, passed over. And then they persevered. And that's what you're being called to do in that same, is to persevere, not when it goes everything the way you want it to, but to persevere when it looks like that. And so through prayer, he's able to keep holding on. He's able to keep trusting God. And God's able to bless him and prosper others around him. That's one of the things that gets my attention to all this. When he's in the house of Potiphar, yes, his station improves a little bit from field servant to house servant to steward of the house. But the reality is, is that when you were daddy's favorite and you were a wealthy son's uh, you, you were a wealthy son and the manager of all of his household and you were in finery and things like that, that being at the top of the poop pile is still the poop pile. Being at the top of the prison, being the top slave in the house, it still sucks. It's still horrible. It's not something you want to be. Nobody in here would sign up willingly and say, man, the thing I want to be is I want to be the chief slave. How many Americans signing up for that one? How many of you will say to yourself, man, what I really want to do is go to prison and be the, the guy that the prison guards like? 
See, don't cheapen what he's been through. Don't Americanize it and, and say to yourself, well, see, you know, I'm supposed to get everything good all the time. No, you're not. If you got what you deserved, that's called hell. And so you and I stop and we wake up from our, our slumber and we realize, man, other people were prospering. Potiphar's house was doing great. Why? Because Joseph was there doing a really good job and a sucky job. Other people were getting rich. Other people's lives were wonderful. Why? Because Joseph's life sucked. It stunk. And what's his attitude in the middle of it? God's doing really great things. Oh, man. You know, sometimes when life is just... crushing you, what you and I need to do is we need to go back and look at the life of Joseph and remember that God's at work even when you're being crushed. Even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it. It's great to sing whenever everything's coming up roses and everything's going well, but what about when life, when you really are being crushed by life? And you're tired of waiting for God's plan for your life. But maybe, maybe what you're missing is you're in it. Maybe you're in it. And when you're tired of waiting, maybe you and I might remind ourselves that maybe it's not that you're waiting on God. Maybe it's because God's waiting on you. See, one of the things I'm confident of is that the gap between who Joseph was when he was thrown in the pit and the gap of, and, and the time that he becomes who he is fit to rule Egypt, that wasn't because God was delaying. That's because Joseph was still becoming the kind of person who was fit to receive all that God had for him. And so the question ultimately comes back to me in this. God, what in me is so stiff-necked, stubborn, unrelenting, unyielding that you're needing to crush me like this right now so that I can be who you have called me to be? There's a, uh, a, a fairly famous... Uh, uh, a writer uh, who, uh, I, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name, I, 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 all of a sudden, um, but I remember he was talking about human nature. And he said, you know, you and I have very, uh, a very small idea of what it means to be created in the image of God. He says, but do you realize that even whenever you meet the most boring, uh, most uh, ugly, uh, uh, most uh, nothing person in your life. When you meet someone who just has nothing to give you, you have nothing to gain from them. You, you don't even like their company. There's nothing about them that's attractive in any way to you. Do you realize that being created in the image of God, that within a short amount of time, that person could become to you the most attractive most awe-inspiring person you've ever met, or they could even become the most terrifying horror that you could ever imagine. I'm reminded of how many people uh, over the years in, in terms of serial killers and the neighbors when they were finally interviewed said, he's just the nicest guy, I, don't, I, I just can't imagine. Or, well, he's a little weird, but I didn't think he was in there eating people. See, here's the thing is that there is a 
potential within each and every one of us in this room, having been created in the image of God, for the Spirit of God to work in you and for you to become something that is really in, intrinsically uh, uh, powerful and, and life-changing, to be used by God in really powerful and amazing ways. And there is the potential within each one of us to become the most destructive, willful, hateful, See, the real difference between a Mother Teresa and a Hitler or a Stalin is their spiritual formation. And what they attain has more to do with what, it, what they're allowing themselves to become or what they are refusing to become. And the truth is, church, as you and I wait that too many of us are literally just, that's all we're doing. We're just waiting. Putting no effort forward in growing in Christ's likeness. Just waiting for somebody to wave a magic wand. And the reality is that what God wants to do in your life the things that most likely are standing between you and that is not time. It's behavior. Right? I mean, over and over again, all throughout, when Jesus is talking, he's always asking questions about how people behave and what they do. But if you and I just like check off the list and do behaviors, that's not the same thing as being a person who's internally transformed by His presence and then do those things out of a sense of belonging to Him and because our idea of ourself and our view of the world and who He is has been transformed. So when you're waiting for God, you need to know God might be waiting for you, waiting for you to be ready, waiting for you to come to an end to yourself. And so here's what you do. Number one, ask yourself, what might need to change in me for this to get done? What's your vision of who you are in Christ? Do you have a vision for who you are in Christ? Can you imagine what it would be like if you were always loving, always kind, patient, what would it look like? What would it look like if the Spirit of Christ was so evident in you that people would say you are full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Is that a vision that you have for your life, or is that just something that's for religion and Sunday mornings? What's the vision that you have for your life? What might need to change for me to get that done? Ask God to show you what you're holding on to or what's holding you up. Forgive those who stand in the way of your dreams. You know, um, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It doesn't work. You, you need to forgive not because it's what's best for them. You need to forgive because it's actually what's best for you. I, you need to forgive them anyhow, but let, let me tell you, it's really what's best for you. Forgive those who stood in the way of your dreams. Ask God who you may need to pray for in that process. And then, and this is really, really, really important, do your current assignment as to the glory of God instead of waiting for a better one to be given to you. Because if you and I do our current assignment poorly, the other assignment doesn't come. It's not how it works. When you do this assignment well, God will be giving you another one, maybe. But if you don't do this one well, the next assignment, ooh, 
You know, Joseph's assignment was to watch his brothers. And his next assignment was to be a slave. I think it's worth it to do your, neck, your, your current assignment well. Because you want to move up the ladder, not down. Hello? All right. Let's stand together. We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit myvineyard.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook or Instagram. God bless and stay safe. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.